In this series of videos, we'll look at the history of American music. In this first one, we'll look at the history of music from the pre-Columbian times through the late 19th century. First, let's look at Native American music. It's difficult today for scholars to document Native American music traditions because the first written accounts came through Europeans and many appeared obviously kind of biased. Nevertheless, scholars have hypothesized that some Native American music traditions actually extend back to the first migration across the Bering Land Bridge from Asia as far back as 20,000 years ago. As the years passed and Native culture adapted throughout the Americas, separate traditions naturally developed and ultimately meshed through contact and trade with and between Native tribes. In general, rhythmic vocalizations, which did not always comprise speech, combined with percussion resembles uh, ancient Siberian traditions, scholars say. Percussion involved objects that when shook made sounds, such as rattles and early forms of stone drums. In many native cultures over time, the vocalizations were combined with speech and the music became part of ceremonies or laden with symbolic meaning. In fact, some native oral traditions have such a rhythmic cadence that they can be considered musical on their own. Songs of all sort were often combined with special attire and specific dances for rituals. Such music was often vital in religious occasions, with some tribes believing the traditions created by their deity and instilling in them special powers. Songs were often used to pass on tribes' history in a form of education, or to promote community when needed. Some tribes had songs considered secret, not for the general public. Gender played a significant role in Native music, as men and women often sang or played an instrument separately or in a way specific to them. Traditional Native music often started slowly and increased its rhythm and meter as the song progressed. As time passed, the songs became more musically complex, in part because of new or improved instruments and more distinctive to individual tribes. Depending on the location and time, Native instruments included various forms of flutes and reed instruments, wood drums made with stretched animal skins, whistles made from wood and bones, and various forms of bells. They used rasp, or sticks with notches that made sound when rubbing the notches together. Coastal tribes used shells such as conch shells in a form of trombone. Flutes from bamboo, bone, or wood were quite common and unique in that they had two chambers, top and bottom, unlike flutes in other cultures. Strings instruments, however, were not common at all, at least until the Europeans introduced them. The arrival of European colonists in the late 16th and early 17th century brought a number of distinct musical styles to America. The early Puritans, for example, sang ritualized psalms, but thought secular music sinful. They even thought the use of musical instruments in complex vocal or musical liturgy in their churches distasteful because it reminded them of Catholicism. Singing religious psalms was, however, so important to the Puritans that one of the first books ever published in America was the Bay Psalm Book, published in 1640, and it remained in use for over a century. The first colonists in Virginia also sang in churches. Because many early colonists were still illiterate, however, the practice of lining out in church singing was common. This was when a leader would sing the line and then the congregation would follow. Instrumental music came to the South in Jamestown as early as 1618, when the first fiddle arrived. Playing music and dancing quickly caught on so much that the Virginia governor even tried banning them on the Sabbath. As time passed, of course, these religious restrictions faded. By the 18th century, even in Puritan New England, organs were common in the wealthier churches. In the 17th century, early English arrivals would have known music from theater, such as those presented with Shakespeare plays. But all arrivals brought their own region or nation's folk traditions. Ballots recounting legends in music were in all European cultures, but in colonial America, broadside ballads grew in popularity. These ballads, with the lyrics printed on a one-sided, primitively printed paper known as a broadside, often were less complex and formal than the legend ballads of Europe. They involved more mundane matters and even included drinking songs, with the lyrics often applied to different tunes. As the time passed and taverns developed, music and singing naturally was a complement to drinking and socializing. 
stringed instr instruments such as the fiddle or violin remained the most popular musical instruments. For much of the Clono era, the idea of a professional musician was frowned upon. Rather, people with the means, and thus the middle class and wealthier primarily, tried to develop their own musical skills. It was considered a sign of a gentleman to know and play an instrument. Wealthy Americans might have even had music rooms. Women, seen as the arbiters of culture, were frequently trained in music. The same was true for dance. As cities grew in the 18th century, more organized musical activity took place. In the middle of the 18th century, Charleston, South Carolina had become the center of music in the South. There, the first musical society, the St. Cecilia Society, was formed in 1766, named for the patron saint of music. It organized regular concerts for its paying membership. In the North, cities such as New York, Boston, and Philadelphia all developed an extensive music scene. By the end of the colonial era, opera had grown. Colonial Americans largely stuck to traditional European musical forms, although with the Great Awakening in the mid-18th century, reformist so-called New Light ministers began rearranging traditional psalms and even composing new ones, much to the chagrin of the more staid Old Light ministers. In a sense, at least, the American broadside ballads and these new psalms constituted the first American music. Throughout the colonial era, of course, African slaves arrived with their own musical traditions. African music was more polyrhythmic than music in other parts of the world. It combined different forms of percussion instruments and rhythms in the same song. A major contribution of African music was not only its variety of drums and beats, but also its call and response vocals. Both these musical traditions contributed to the eventual rise of a distinct American music, but the call and response vocals particularly suited the religious hymns sung by the whites. One instrument introduced by African slaves was the banjo, which had roots back to Africa. Slaves made banjos by hollowing out a gourd or a calabash and then attaching a long neck. The slaves then stretched a piece of animal hide, usually from a raccoon, over the bowl and attached four strings. Many slave owners encouraged their slaves to sing as they work, believing that it improved morale and made the slaves work harder. They generally required that all tunes remain cheerful and pleasant in tone to ensure that this occurred. Many feared, however, that drums might be used to communicate between slaves and thus ban them. The slave work songs, therefore, often included clapping and stomping to give the song the rhythm and beat sought. During the American Revolution, the American army used a fife and drum corps, not only uh, to make the music improve morale, but also to communicate. It was used to signal when to wake up, when to marshal the troops, and you know, what to do in battle. During the American Revolution, British soldiers sang the song Yankee Doodle, its music dating back centuries in Europe and its lyrics changing over the years. The term doodle added to mean playing the music badly or, or foolishly. At the British surrender, the Americans turned the song, which had been meant as a ridicule, back at the British. In time, the new American lyrics became popular, not as ridicule, but as patriotism. As the early national era began in the early 19th century, the piano had begun to spread to America. The piano was actually a relatively new invention, invented around the beginning of the 18th century by an Italian who wanted greater volume with a harpsichord and thus replaced its plucking mechanism with a hammer. Soon there was an Italian term for, quote, a harpsichord that can play soft and loud noises, unquote, which was shortened in time to the name piano. Pianos were expensive and not yet made in America, so only a few wealthy people had them. In the early national era, the guitar also became more popular in America. As early as the 17th century, Spanish settlers had brought a European-style guitar with five sets of double strings. By 1800, the six-string instrument known today had evolved in southern Europe and was brought over from places like Italy and France. The instrument was popular enough by 1816 that the first instruction book was published. Most of these guitars were smaller than modern models and were strung with gut strings and plucked with the fingers. While the instrument didn't catch on with the southern working class during the antebellum age, it did with African Americans in the Mississippi Delta region which of course later became famous for birth of the blues music. 
The nationalism of the early national era led to Americans creating their own compositions. A number of marches and sonatas were popular during this period. Just after the Revolution, for example, the English musician Alexander, Alexander Renagel, and you can see him on the below left there, immigrated to America and became famous as an American composer. George Washington was a big fan of Renagel. At the same time, another English immigrant, Benjamin Carr, and you can see him on the below right there, arrived in open stores selling musical instruments in several large cities, one of the first to do so. He was also a music publisher and editor, publishing Philip Thiel's composition, The President's March, which quickly became one of the era's most popular patriotic songs. In fact, when political parties emerged, the Federalist Party adopted the song as its rallying call. Of course, the nation's most famous patriotic song was A Star-Spangled Banner. The lyrics come from a poem by the lawyer Francis Scott Key, who was impressed by the large American flag flying over Baltimore's Fort McHenry after a particularly bad bombardment by the British during the War of 1812. The poem's lyrics were set to a British drinking song that was already popular in America. Although the poem has uh, four stanzas, only the first is commonly sung today. The U.S. Navy adopted the song as its own in the late 19th century, which led to its adoption as the country's official national anthem in 1931. In 1842, the New York Philharmonic was founded. It was the first symphony orchestra in the United States. The first symphony to be composed by an American was later, however, after the Civil War in the 1880s. The religious revival of the Second Great Awakening that spread across the United States in the early 19th century spawned new songs, just as the earlier First Great Awakening had. One of the most popular was the song Glory Hallelujah. As Second Great Awakening's ministers traveled around the country with camp meetings that drew thousands, Glory Hallelujah became one of the nation's most popular so-called spirituals, and, and they were so popular they weren't just sung in churches. During the Civil War, music was popular on both sides to raise morale. Along with fife and drums from the earlier years, the bugle was used to communicate. Singing was a popular pastime in camp, and the war brought together different strands of music, spreading them across the nation. The war, of course, inspired patriotic songs, and each side adopted their own favorites, often played by new brass bands. The U.S. Army adopted requirements that each regiment had to have a brass band. The Confederate States of America adopted the song God Save the South as its national anthem, but the song Dixie was by far the most popular. Even Lincoln liked the song, asking a band to play it at the end of the war. The other popular song in the South was the Bonnie Blue Flag, describing an early flag of the Confederacy. As the United States didn't have a national anthem yet, Union troops often sang two songs, the Battle Cry of Freedom and the Battle Hymn of the Republic. The Battle Hymn of the Republic was the most popular, having grown from the song Glory Hallelujah, which I just mentioned, and it had, been, it had new melodies added and had been renamed John Brown's Body. But in the Civil War, Julia Ward Howe added new patriotic lyrics that maintained the song's original, you know, religious orientation. Her famous lyrics, My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, spoke of, of the view that the wicked South would soon pay. A huge influence on music was the invention of the phonograph by Thomas Edison in the late 19th century, a way to record and replay sounds. At first, Edison wrapped a foil around a cylinder. A handle turned the cylinder, which contained a needle that vibrated when Edison spoke, leaving a groove on the foil. Another needle would subsequently trace the grooves and replicate the sound. Edison quickly improved his phonograph using a vinyl disc, which was not so readily destroyed upon the replaying. Later, in the 1940s, these discs became known as records, and the phonograph a record player. As Edison's phonograph spread, vinyl records became immediately popular. This, of course, led to the growth of the recording industry. In the 1880s, Columbia Records was founded, the first record label in the United States. The growing wealth of the late industrial age, of course, impacted music, not only in the spread of the recording industry. It became popular for the new middle class to emulate the wealthy in having parlors in their homes fitted with musical instruments, kind of like a, a music room. The piano became particularly popular during this period. 
Families would retire to their parlors after dinner to enjoy music, often played by their children who were taught music as a sign of class distinction. By the late 19th century, African Americans had adopted a new form of music known as ragtime. Drawing from their African polyrhythmic traditions, African Americans in such cities as New Orleans and St. Louis modified the beat of marches, speeding them up and making them more complex. The result was ragged, but upbeat and entertaining. Victorian culture looked down upon ragtime as uncouth, undoubtedly racism playing a part. Vaudeville and ragtime, which seemed to emphasize having fun, seemed a challenge to their strict upper crust morality of the day. In New York, ragtime became popular in what was called Tin Pan Alley, a part of the city with clubs and recording studios, and you can see it here. In any event, this uh, concludes the first of the videos on the history of American music, this one going through the end of the 19th century.